morning. This is Tucker Goodrich. Uh, I am here with four physicians. And this morning, we're going to talk about how to change a medical practice to take account of what we are learning about the effects of a healthy diet on health and how you can take sort of a different path from simply prescribing drugs and doing interventions to helping to maintain people's health and increase their health using a dietary therapy approach. Um, two of the doctors here, Brian Lenskis and Tro Collagian, have take have sort of led the way down this path. I think Brian Brian went first and then helped Tro to transition his um, practice. Some of the physicians who are on this um, discussion have seen their own health dramatically improve um, by, you know, altering their diet, some cases away from what the standard practices would recommend and have seen dramatic increases in their own health. I've certainly seen that myself, which is how I got interested in this whole topic. And uh, Tro is, of course, kind of the poster child for this. A few years back, he was 350 pounds, and now he runs five plus minute miles, which pisses me off no end because I've been training for 10 years and I still can't do that. <laughs> um, so do you, do you gentlemen want to, uh, want to introduce yourself? Why don't, why don't we start with you, Brian? You're the old man in the room. Yeah, I'm the old man, you know, 18 years of standard practice switched over to, you know, what we call direct primary care. And, you know, Tro went first and he was like, Brian, what's wrong with you, man? You're in the system. I was, crushing myself you know i went to usc had four hundred thousand dollars in med school loans and you know you start realizing uh oh if you say certain things you can get taken out really quickly if you're in a big practice or if you work for a big group um so you know i said well you can't be effective helping patients in eight minute visits or 12 minutes or 15 depending on the group so the problem is you see this train wreck in front of you and you say here's a pill here's a pill here's a pill so you're doing damage control so i think that's the 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 formula for burnout. So I would work through lunch and, and stay late every night and sacrifice time with my family to really try to help people because I couldn't be paid for it. I had to do it on my own. So I started realizing there's something wrong with a model where I, where the sicker my patient gets, the more I make because I could put more diagnosis code. So those are the things that, that, that when we're in practice for a long time, we start seeing, and then you start realizing every year, the reimbursement to the primary care goes down and the cost to the patient goes up, you think, okay, well, how is this happening? What, Where's that extra money going? And then you start realizing where the cost of medicine is in, in, in diagnosis and all that kind of stuff. So I'm an internal medicine doc and I stepped out on my own. Now I have two uh, practices focusing on metabolic health uh, in the big picture of like what's killing us. And, you know, the, if you look at the five big ones from Ben Bickman, it's really like not being stressed all the time. High stress levels kills you, you know, basically high insulin level, high stress drinking more a lot of docs are going home and drinking at night smoking they're doing other stuff because they're stressed out all the time make sure you get enough sleep us doctors pride ourselves in not sleeping we, we brag about how little sleep we can function with right and then you know, ironic, process food. there's nothing more obviously shown to be negative for both health and function than not getting enough sleep i mean pilots and truck drivers have sleep requirements but not physicians yeah, and chronic stress and anxiety and all those things, and then and then not exercising because you don't have time. You had to figure it in your family somewhere. So it's those kind of things. I started stepping back, saying, "Look, I'm killing myself in this practice. I'm killing myself in order to help people." So that was that's in a nutshell. I think that's what all of us are going through. Hopefully, I'm speaking correctly for for everyone here. Yeah, Tro, you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, I don't know where to start, man. Uh, all I can say is God is good, um, and you know about. 10 years ago, uh, in between, you know, my daughter is, is, is going to be 10. So it was right around that time where my wife was starting to get concerned about my health. I was 350 pounds. And, uh, I remember her eventually she was pregnant with our third kid. And, you know, in between that time, I started to try to understand, uh, really obesity. Uh, she had really challenged me to do that intellectually um to understand what it is and and uh how to approach it for my own sake and at the 
time I was, you know, I, I finished residency. I was a chief resident in internal medicine and uh, I was out working for a hospital and, and there was just so many things wrong. Uh, the biggest hospital system in New Jersey, uh, they covered up a doctor who was being inappropriate with patients. They covered up another doctor who was abusing opioids. They were asking me to do uh, to refer only in their network and not to other competent uh, referrers. Um, and quickly, I got a taste of what hospital system medicine is about, which is about uh, referrals, imaging, and labs, right? Can you generate those? So doctors are, every doctor that works for a hospital system generates about one to one and a half million dollars in revenue for that system through their ordering uh, of, of these things. So I quickly understood that I was not a, uh, I was not actually helping people, right? I was not actually helping people. And the system incentivizes you to see people in less time and more frequently, right? To see them in five minutes and bring them back again and do unnecessary things like EKGs and spirometries and all these things that you can you know, generate more insurable visits for. Um, so, you know, I'm learning about obesity medicine and metabolic health, and I'm experiencing as a attending physician, really what's normal to most other doctors, you know, this, this system of insurance, which is not normal. Um, you know, I have med students and residents that I train now that they know about billing codes and they don't know which drugs lower mortality in MI, right? They know that a 99215, you need, you know, four, uh, four key components of the medical decision-making and they can't list the drugs that decrease mortality in an active MI, right? So, so they're focusing so on something's the gone bureaucratic on. process instead of the health process. Yeah, yeah. So something's gone on in medicine and medical education that is highly corrupting and it and you it's insidious i mean it's normal like nobody would say that this is a problem and sure everybody takes insurance but it is a corrupting force right because they pay you not the patient right they're paying you for for visits and if they pay you less what are you going to do you're going to make those visits less and if they pay you to do ekgs you're going to do ekgs that you don't need and if they pay you to do spirometry because you're getting paid less, you're going to do unnecessary spirometry. And you're going to, so you're taught to think in their system and not about what does this patient need to get healthy, which is all those five things Brian listed. So th this was a key pivotal moment for me as a doctor. And that's when I went, I got red pilled. We were talking about this after, before the call, talking, you said red pilled where it hits you that we're in like this system that doesn't keep, that it's not about patients. And it takes a toll on the doctor. It takes a toll to see that you're not helping people, right? And uh, and all you're doing is paper pushing, right? It, it takes, and that's why we have physician burnout. They're not helping people. So as I'm helping myself and I'm losing 150 pounds and you know over a number of years, I'm thinking about how do we make medicine great? You know, how do we make it easy? So, so that's my story. In the last, you know, six years, I've been laser focused on creating the most amazing practice. I've got to help other doctors set up their practices like, like Brian, and, and hopefully we'll take some more steps uh, in another direction to keep helping doctors set up amazing practices. Uh, I helped Phil Ovedia in Florida set up his practice. He's a, um, part, he's a interventional cardiac surgeon, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but he but he's uh, you know expanding a metabolic health clinic, right? So I think the um, so where I am right now is you know uh, doing what Brian's doing, actually helping people with those five pillars that he talked about. You know, stress, sleep, diet, activity, you know, relationships, community, and screening. Um, but uh, it's also how to make medicine excellent, and and that's been my my laser focus. Uh, and I'll stop, pause here, because Brian always tells me I talk too much. 
No, that was that was great. Thank you, Tro. Uh, Josh, why don't you uh, why don't you go next? Since Brian Brian's the has the shortest tenure as a practicing physician here of the group. So Josh, sure. Josh Durham is my personal physician here in Boise, Idaho, and uh, very amusingly left a comment on my blog after I moved out here saying, hey, if you need a doc here in Idaho, why don't you come see me? And that is exactly what wound up happening. Um, and he's got his own personal health story, <laughs> a lot of stories. As a former boxer, he's got all sorts <laughs> of interesting stories, not the typical uh, medical background. Um, go ahead, Josh. Sure. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I, uh, I, I graduated medical school in 2005. And up until about five years ago, I practiced what I would call standard medicine um, and um, felt like I was doing a really good job at it. Uh, I was a Golden Glove boxer for like 12 years. I was always in shape, always working out. And then I transitioned into long distance running. Um, and after about 10 years of that, I woke up one day and I weighed about 238 pounds and I couldn't couldn't figure out why I would, I, I would cut my calories. I'd run seven miles in 60 minutes, six days a week. And I just kept feeling worse and worse. And I'm tired and lethargic. My joints hurt. My back hurt. I had brain fog and uh, ran some blood, blood work on me and was pre-diabetic with uh, signs of fatty liver disease, uh, mixed hyperlipidemia, blood pressure was bad, probably had sleep apnea. And I was kind of dumbfounded and I kind of, I looked in the mirror and I said basically to myself, you know, if I got to go on four pills, whatever lifestyle I'm teaching my patients and whatever I'm doing obviously isn't working. And so I refused to take medicine because I felt like if I'm the doctor and I'm sick and I've got to take all these pills, that just doesn't seem right to me. So I started um, listening to podcasts and doctors that claimed they cured things with food um, because before I got sick, I just would roll my eyes and kind of, you know, tell my patients, yeah, yeah, I doubt that'll really work basically. But um, I, I got lucky and I happened to be at a CME that Eric Westman was talking at. Um, who Eric, is... Eric Westman is a very prominent low carb physician who's been treating obesity for decades and if i remember correctly wrote the current version of the atkins diet just background for everybody yeah so he gave a lecture and it was it was interesting and i thought well this actually makes a lot of sense so i decided to to uh take it on and it was it was interesting and the first the first several weeks was kind of rough because i i couldn't I wasn't fat adapted, of course, and didn't understand all of that stuff. But uh, it took me about two months before I could even run like three or four miles again, because I, I it just it was just it was just hard on my body. But um, anyway, long story short, I uh, I ended up getting the weight off. Labs started to improve, um, but it was weird because like every time I would you know cheat and eat some carbs or something, I'd balloon right back up, and then. Um, decided to try a carnivore diet for like three and a half months. Uh, actually, I was only going to do it for a month, but I felt so good. I kept going for three and a half months. But during that time, I was like, why? Why do I feel even better? What's going on? And I happened to come across a podcast with Paul Saladino and Tucker. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I cut out all these seed oils. Because when I was doing my standard keto, I was eating ranch and blue cheese and mayo like it was candy. Um so then that took me to basically the last two years where I've done, you know, low carb, low six, and uh, it's just been a dramatic change. And so along this way, for the last five years, I've been trying to work with patients on this, and I've had a lot of good success stories, um, but I struggle. It's hard because I don't have a good support system or a, a good program like I would want it to be. Now that I've learned what I've learned, I really would like to uh, set up a more in-depth program for patients because it's tough. I mean, I'm spending 30 minutes 
trying to teach them nutrition and uh and it's exhausting and um probably confusing for a lot of them so i'm still in my infancy i'm trying to figure out the best approach to help patients but um it's it's pretty neat when you get somebody who does it and you know they've been on insulin for 20 years and now they're off of it it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty satisfying. And I've, I've yeah, been pretty burned out off oxygen, as you told us about yeah. when yeah. last time we talked to you. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting stuff, seeing people's like antibodies that have been positive for years, all of a sudden switch to normal. And you're like, wait a minute, did we just get rid of that autoimmune disorder? It's, it's, it's fascinating, but um, so it, it, it's given me a little more vigor for my profession and excitement but, uh, but I've had a lot of burnout the last few years as well. So uh, when you get those successful cases, though, it's kind of a, a good boost for you. But that's kind of where I'm at. Okay, thanks, Josh. Ryan, you're the rookie on the team here. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> and you've got, you've got probably the most interesting story because you came into this, I would wager, with more of a nutrition background than probably any of your three physician colleagues. Yeah, so um, I'm Dr. Brian Curley. Uh, a lot of folks know me from my meme meme account on Twitter, Cedol Disrespector. So <clears throat> Tucker and I actually have a similar background from the origins. We both got into the paleo, quote unquote, and the ancestral health movement from the internet in the late 2000s. Um, and uh, but my for me, that was a motivation to just start learning physiology, pathophysiology, just like any other, you know, all the other physicians here, you get some sort of bug and you want to get into healthcare, right? Uh, you know, people always say, why do you want to get into healthcare? You want to help people and you just couldn't stop reading or couldn't stop learning. And so for me, it was that, that ancestral health world and seeing um, how the environment and the, and, and food can be uh, intimately involved in the pathophysiology and the development of these diseases. Um, one of my, um, uh, through that interest, um, you know, I, I got into the trenches somewhat that I could, uh, being a, someone in my twenties at the time working full time and doing all of my pre-med at night and, you know, taking days off work to, to shadow and whatnot. One of my letters of recommendation for med schools from Dr. Alessio Fasano, who, um, was a celiac researcher. So, which was probably the which most was, famous celiac researcher in the world. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was excellent. You know, he um uh, he you know let me right in there. Um, and uh, and in the clinic, I remember looking at, you know histology, looking at slides with him, and you know it was it was excellent. And being someone that was real nerdy in the paleo world, that was like an all star, right? It was great. Even though he wasn't a paleo blogger, he was you know one of the the researchers that that folks were were pointing to the benefits of a of a gluten free diet, for instance. So long long story short, um, I started med school in my thirties. Uh, 2014, and I just was at like like everyone else here, you know, drink, drinking water from a fire hose. I was too busy to, uh, you know, for the extracurricular activities of other nutrition. You know, if you asked me in 2014 or even 2010 about diet, I would say, you know, it 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 looks like a ancestral health um, approach is uh, most appropriate. Looking at things from that from that perspective, from that lens. Some combination of the big three offenders, which are refined grains, sugar, and at the time, what we refer to as industrial seed oils. Um, and, you know, I, there was a great doctor, um, uh, Kurt Harris, who described them as the Neolithic agents of disease. I remember yes. thinking, excellent. That's a great summary. I love it. So, you know, by the time I started med school, I was like, there it is. The, uh, the NADs, the Neolithic agents of disease. I, I was a big fan of the Whole30 program because they did so well rebranding paleo, making it not controversial, you know, talking about, you know, cavemen, just, hey, try these things. All of us now, we can go to our local grocery store and find things labeled Whole30, um, and it makes it easier for folks. So up till, you know, the beginning of my third year of residency, so I, I did family medicine training, I'm currently a hospitalist, I would just tell patients, I would write, I actually had a little pad with my name on it, Brian Curley DO, and I'd write Whole30 on it, I'd say, you could Google this, you know, you can find, um, uh, you know, uh, food um, plans for free on the internet, no problem. But the big change for me was when, um, you know, I had to admit to myself that I was hypertensive. And I was like, okay, I'm 39. You know, I thought that I had a good middle approach. I've never been super strict about food. I never was one that was very overweight. You know, I got skinny fat, but um, 
Uh, you know, I was, I was never um, too unhealthy, nothing that was scaring me, but the, the hypertension thing I had to take seriously. So I jumped back into that world. And with my, my medical training, um, you know, my, you know, my ability to read papers, you know, in, in my third year of residency was completely different than when I was just a pre-med student, you know, over a decade prior. Um, and what I realized in my opinion is that out of those three things, I would say that, that seed oils are, are, are toxic. I believe that they're the main contributor and that they also corrupt our ability to digest and metabolize other things. So I, I became a, an evangelist on the topic and that's, that's why I'm here because I got, I got popular through that evangelism. And, and uh, how's your was, blood pressure doing? It's perfect. So I actually had to have someone come in and do a physical on me for, for um, uh, life insurance. I remember thinking like, okay, I take my own blood pressure, but here's the uh, moment of truth. And it was excellent. It was perfect. So um, not even stage one, it was excellent. My systolic was like 120 or something like that. And uh, I was like, I'll take it <laughs> for 40 years old. And um, so, you know, uh, uh, happy to be here. I, I don't have as much experience with as you all. I have some some success stories that I could share. Um, residency because I did family medicine. So I did lots of, um, lots of clinic and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to share my perspective on those things, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear what everyone else has to say about their practices and, you know, how to, you know, how to navigate this paradigm shift, you know, cause we've got folks like, um, Dr. Durham who has his own practice, but he has to find out a way to, to make that work within the system that he's in. Then you have, um, folks like Dr. Tro who have, built an, an amazing organization, just, just having an app and, you know, for that mental real estate, for, for people to be able to use that and, 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 you know, a, a buddy that they can have with them to help them make these decisions. I'm not familiar with, um, is it, it Dr. Len, Lenskis? I'm not familiar with your, with your um, uh, organization, but, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about what you all do. Okay. And my background real quick, I'm the patient here in the group. I would call myself. I, had a bunch of health issues and spent, you know, spent a lot of money on healthcare. I had a concierge relationship with a very good, but very conventional physician and saw him regularly because I needed to see him regularly and had a bunch of, you know, extended stays in the hospital for various different things and was able to resolve everything um, by changing my diet and discovered that not only could I do it for myself and for my family, but my colleagues at work, um, you know, I started explaining what I was doing to people because the change in my personal appearance was so dramatic that the people I worked with started asking me what I was doing. And I realized that this is really kind of a fundamental, fundamental issue and did a lot of research and advocacy since then on what I've learned. I'm a self-taught engineer by background and sort of brought that approach to this that problem solving approach to this whole thing but and i can be a pretty solid critic i will say of medical practice but i also recommend i also recognize that you know medicine's not the enemy there are lots of conditions i mean if you get a car crash go see a doctor don't try and change your diet <laughs> right and if you're and if you like me have been in the you know, or like all of us have been in the industrial food system your whole life, you're going to need some, you know, you're going to need some help from a physician transitioning off of it, especially if you are on any sorts of medications, because some of these medications, if you are still taking it and the condition that it's there to treat like hypertension goes away, they can start having fairly negative effects on you, um, Insulin's the most obvious example. If you're taking insulin and you go on a low carb diet, you can wind up being hypoglycemic to a dangerous level very quickly. And you need to work with a, you need to be working with a physician partner who understands that process and can help you through that process so you can regain your health the way we all have in one way or another. Um, so, Tro, what was what's the biggest change? that you've seen in the way that you're treat that you're interacting with patients because i one of the things i want to accomplish here is make patients understand what kind of difference it's going to be for them to work with a physician who's addressing metabolic health and not just reacting to 
metabolic health crises because I think most I think we all agree that most of the most of the medical practices practice now is addressing the medical health the metabolic health crisis that our entire country is in and that most individuals are in right overweight hypertension you know pre-diabetic what's what's the biggest change in your practice yeah yeah in in my practice sorry just say that a little bit louder i, I didn't come in so yeah. what is the biggest change that you see when you interact from a patient's perspective? What's the biggest difference oh. between being a hosp being being oh. in a hospital? Obviously oh that's acute care and you're not developing a relationship with people the same way you are now, but from the patient's perspective, what's the biggest difference? Yeah, so so right now I think you have to understand the problem as a patient uh, most people come to expect from their doctor or their healthcare team uh, that you're going to call their office once a year twice a year you're going to wait on hold for about 15 minutes you're going to get an appointment that appointment will last seven minutes you'll be waiting in the waiting room for about an hour right that's that's their understanding of modern medicine right most patients understanding of modern medicine um, and you know, I think one of the things that I've focused on is how to make medicine great and how to make it easier, accessible, you know, <clears throat> and um, meet the patient's needs. So what does the patient need? Like, like I was listening to Dr. Brian's story on when he sort of, you know, woke up and got that fire to learn something. Well, our patients have that, right? And and the same thing that happened with, with uh, Dr. Josh here, where he said, um, <clears throat> You know, he had this moment of truth where he had these diseases and he's like, something's got to change, right? These are the things our patients face every single moment and they don't have the resources necessarily and the ability to, you know, be uh, <clears throat> as critical as us on the, the nutritional literature to be able to figure this out on their own. And so what happens, right? Like they gain more and more weight, they try Weight Watchers, they try, you know, low fat diets, they try, I mean you know, even low carb diet, whatever it is, they're trying, right? And we live in an addictive food environment, right? We live in a, you guys call it the industrial food environment. I call it an addictive food environment, right? And ultimately they're going to fail. We know 90% of them will fail. And if you look at the chronic disease epidemics that we have, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, overweight, metabolic syndrome, it's 90% of the population which means 90% of people out there are living a sick life and a sick life is normal for them. So what we have to understand, I think in medicine is that there's this spark in our patients. There's a spark in our patients and that minute they're like, holy crap, I need to change, right? And there are literally industries around them not changing and, and being continually being harmed. There's an addictive food environment. There's you know doctors who just wanna keep seeing them, pharmaceutical companies who wanna give them more drugs. I mean, there's not many people who have successfully demonstrated that they can help people lose weight and keep it off, right? Lose diabetes and keep it gone, right? Virta is maybe one of the only examples uh, that's actually demonstrated that. So, so I think the problem is we're dealing with uh, we're dealing with people who are just like us who want to change and they they need help, and so. How do you deliver that help? That's the question, right? How do you deliver that help? How do you remove the barriers, right? How do people want want help? Well, what are they doing now? They're downloading my fitness pal. So we need to be able to reach them on an app store. They're going to YouTube. We need to be able to reach them on YouTube. We need to provide them a, a compelling story of the problem and the solution in a way that is engaging and captivating. Well, there's podcasts just like, you know, Dr. Brian said he was listening to podcasts, right? Um, so, so what has happened in my clinic, um, I think has been this laser focus. You know, if you're 350 pounds, I was 350 pounds. I didn't want to walk into an office. I didn't want to see an ex boxer, you know, tell me to lose weight, right? I didn't want that, right? I didn't want uh, to feel that I don't, I probably wouldn't have even fit in the, the chairs in your office because, you know, I had struggle fitting into an airplane, right? And I'm highly skeptical. I don't believe that you're actually going to be able to help me. You know, if you if you could have, everybody else in the waiting room would have been looking different, 
right? So, uh, so the problem is uh, we have to reach people who don't believe they can get help are disenfranchised because they've been literally taken advantage of with, you know, supplements and get, you know, lose weight quick schemes. And, uh, and they don't trust the medical system, right? And especially after these last three years, they don't trust the medical system. So, so our practice, so, so let's, so what's the solution, right? The solution is easy access. When they have questions, they should be able to contact an office, text an office, get a live human, get answers. They should be able to get asynchronous education, right? The majority of what they need to know should be able to be reached in a way when it has nothing to do with the visit, right? They, they shouldn't have to wait three months to come see me. Right now, the wait list to see me is like four or five months, right? They shouldn't have to wait four months to stop. They should be able to get information in a clear curriculum and they can start right now when when it's good for them. They should be able to watch a video, read something in a clear sort of curriculum when it's easy for them when they're in the bathroom, just, you know, going on social media, instead of going on social media, they need infotainment to understand what is their problem and how to combat it. And then they need high quality, you know, uh, information, right? Like, should I be eating low carb? Should I be lowering my uh, uh, omega-6? Uh, should I be, you know, adding fat or removing fat? What should I do, right? They need answers to this. And then they need a community right? Nobody wants to be doing this alone, right? So in our app right now, so you download our app, right? Dr. Tro app, it'll be, the name will be changed soon, but, and you get a, you know, 10,000 people that are trying to work on their health, right? And you get a curriculum, a defined curriculum on what hunger is, what nutrition is, what, what are different components that you need to take into account? So wait, 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 wait one second there. You have 10,000 patients, no, we have 10,000 people on our app. Okay, but they're a, effectively following your program. Well, it's not a medical app, so it's an information app. And okay. on on the app, this is what they get, right? They get, um, we, we have a meeting that they can go to literally every day, right? Monday, there's a, there's a sort of a live stream. Tuesday, there's an interactive meeting with, you know, 50 to 100 people. And there's a dedicated curriculum that they can come to. On Wednesdays, they can do, there's a monthly rotated chat on food, exercise, stress, uh, and I'm blanking on the last one. Uh, I think it's just a Q&A. We have dedicated cycles of programs just getting started on a low-carb diet, on a metabolically health-focused diet, right, where we give them, so if they join the app, they know their next sort of introduction to low-carb is coming um, in, a, in a month or two. They have more advanced courses they could take. We have courses on CGMs, biofeedback. Every day of the week, there's something that they can go to. Background again, a CGM is a continuous glucose monitor, and you're using that in part as a tool to teach people about the effect that food is having on their body. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you go, I mean, if you go have potato, right, versus French fries cooked in seed oil, you can see the difference right away. I mean, right then and there, you can see the glycemic difference, right? So not that we advocate either one of those, but um, but the point is, is that we empower patients with biofeedback. We empower patients with asynchronous education. We give them a community and a dedicated program they can follow and live people they can interact with. I mean, the the this is what medicine should be. And then if they need help beyond that, we can get them a CGM right through the app, by the way. So they can just get a CGM, order a CGM through our clinic. Um, but then if they need more help, if they have medications, if there's, you know, like the, you know, what you said, you know, if you're, if you're reversing disease, you may have medications that need to be adjusted. Well, then they can come contact us. They can text us, right? They'll get a live health coach in literally one to two days that'll meet with them to like guide them on what to expect and what's expected. So, so, you know, and along their journey, they can text our office and get feedback on what to do because there's a million questions. An average patient in our program in our six month intensive program meets with us about 20 times. They're interacting with our office with 500 touch points, app, scale, CGM use, you know, appointments, health coaching, text messaging, you know, sharing, you know, something, getting feedback 500 times in six months. 
and our results, which we've published, um, you know, in six months, our our weight loss is thirty four pounds. And one year, our weight loss is fifty one pounds. Right? Average. And so, average. Yeah. Yeah. So average, and that's a you know range of like fifteen to one hundred and fifteen pounds, right, at one year. And this is our through our employee wellness cohort that we've been tracking very closely. So um, this is on par with mir miracle drugs, right? Um, so, you know, this is the practice. I've, I've been laser focused on this and I've had, luckily, you know, Brian along the way, we shoot ideas off each other and, you know, we, we you know, we talk about ways to sort of help and work together. And, uh, you know, certainly the podcast has helped, I think, um, that we do the Low Carb MD podcast. But the mission has been, how do we reach those people? And, and it's not always, you know, uh, and, and I want to say community and I don't want to say spirituality, but community is also part of it. I mean, there's food, you know, and that's one aspect is behavior, which is a huge element of it, but community and, and really connecting with humans. It's like, it's like, that's what medicine is, right. Figuring out what they actually need help with. Right. Um, well, I don't want to. I don't want to turn people off. You said it's an addictive food environment. A lot of this, the approach that you're doing, sounds not dissimilar to Alcoholic or Narcotics Anonymous, where you're using community to help people stay on the straight and narrow, and education to help them understand why they need to do it. You know, it's a holistic. And I how hate to use the term holistic and how? approach? Not, not just why, Tucker, but how? How? Okay. Right? How to do it right and. We, we made a, so you, you're absolutely right. We, we took a lot of playbooks from them. So throughout my entire career, ever since I wanted to lose weight, I wanted a binge eating hotline, like a get help now hotline, right? Where somebody is like, when, so, so let's come back to what's the laser vision. The laser vision is something I call moment zero, right? So somebody's having a stroke, somebody's having a heart attack, somebody's about to eat off plan, somebody's about to drink and they, they, they shouldn't be, right? because that's the goal they decide. Something bad is about to happen medically, right? And so moment zero is being able to meet somebody then and there, right? Like send it, calling your doctor, getting a live human, like I'm having chest pain, what should I do? Like that's the moment you want as a doctor because you're about to be able to send them, take an aspirin, shave your groin or shave your wrist and head to the nearest, you know, go visit Dr. Brian in his hospital, right? Because you know you're going to get a catheterization. Call nine one one first. <laughs> yeah, call nine one one first, right? So, but uh, but the idea here is, you know, can we get to as close to possible as uh, as disease as we can? And when you're dealing with lifestyle disease, it's it's that eating off plan, drinking off plan. Can we get and they and they didn't want it. Not they wanted it. Not they're at a birthday party and they wanted to taste something. I'm not talking about that. But the time where they ate something and they didn't want to. Right. The time they drank something and then two weeks passes. Right. And they're drinking for two weeks or they're eating, you know, in a way that they're not happy about for two weeks and they regain 10 pounds. You know, Dr. Josh said the minute he goes off low carb, he gains, you know, he gains weight. So how do we reach people? This is the vision is right. How do we reach people at moment zero? Right. Whether it's lifestyle or medical. Right. And so my practice has been focused on on that on that moment. How do we get from months of eating off plan or days after you've had a heart attack to literally that minute, right? That minute, right? The next day, right? Because that moment, if I can affect that patient in that moment, a moment zero, like the minute, like the, just after that issue happened, I'm going to have the best chance for prevention, right? right. I'm going to, if you eat off plan once a week and you're miserable about it for a week, that's the whole year. Right. So my goal has been, how do we reach patients at moment zero as close to as possible? And it literally means reaching out to them and being extraordinary. And that's hard, but that's been the goal. Okay. Brian, can you tell us how you're Brian Lenski's, um, you said you were getting pretty frustrated and obviously you and Tro are working closely together. How has this changed your view of your practice and how you're interacting with patients? It is massively different. Um, seeing patients now, like doing a Zoom meeting like this, I can have 50 patients on and the patients are helping each other. I can sit back and shut up sometimes and just say, look, Tom, tell, tell people your story. 
Maggie, tell people how you came off insulin. Tell this person, and that person who's just starting out now has a role model and someone. So I have relationships that have developed, you know, friendships that have developed that people are going hiking together or walking together. The patients are doing that, right? Or we all get together for a hike, you know, if they're local here in San Diego or Arizona, as the case may be. So um, it's not just it's not just a one on one relationship between you and the patient anymore. It is. It is because when I was doing it in standard practice, like like what Josh and Brian are trying to do, my my medical assistant would say, "Doc, you're saying the same thing all day." And I was thinking, "Gosh, if I could just get fifty people in a room and say the one hour of my time, and it saves me forty nine other hours that I would have to say the same thing over and over again." Right. So I that's totally why I agree with that. Oh I reach out to Tro, Tro, and I go, Tro, look, man, if we do a podcast talking about this stuff, and I get this crazy New Yorker that I don't know, but I heard his story, and I go, man, we could do, we could reach a lot of people, and now we have what ten million downloads, right? And so, you start realizing when things resonate, you go, gosh, dang it, people are frustrated, and you know, like like all the doctors are pointing out. I'll give you a perfect example of doing direct primary care. A, a friend of mine's a surgeon, sent me a patient. Patient comes in, I'm looking, I go, you're healthy, man. You're young, healthy. Why are you coming to see me? You have, you have a primary. And he said, I can't see, this is in May. He said, I can't see my primary for a pre-op uh, clearance until August 5th, right? So you got to wait three months to see your primary to get labs done so you can get cleared in a healthy young guy. So I was like, you know what? I can't take your money. I'll just clear you. Let's get, let me order some labs. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll charge it, whatever it is. Right. And it was a minimal fee. And I, re, I told my office manager, refund this guy because it's ridiculous. He doesn't need metabolic health. He isn't, he, he gets it. I, so this guy's cleared for surgery. He's getting surgery. He will be recovered from surgery by the time he can see his primary. That's absolutely insane, right? It's an insane system. So when you start seeing that and you know, I know. I, I presume I this was elective surgery and not, yeah, it was elective surgery, right? Right. And so, you know, it, it's sad that the the guy has to go outside of his insurance, cash pay labs. It costs like eighty bucks for the labs, which is nothing. So people think if you if you went went through the standard lab, it would be about six hundred dollars. You go through a cash pay lab, it's like it's it's a tenth of the cost, if that. So you start realizing there's a problem with the system. Like first of all, like, it's ex access to the physician. Like people are calling, like they'll call me, they go, look, I called my doctor eight times. No one's called me back. And they're frustrated, right? If you go there and you wait an hour and a half to see your doctor, like people have to work, they have a life. So that's what I mean. Medicine lost the the patient care because they don't care. They have a, if you leave, okay, I got 3000 other patients, go ahead and go, right? That's the attitude. It's like, you're lucky to see me type thing. So now in direct primary care, what Tro and I do, those people are selecting us and they go, look, my health is, is worth it enough that I'll pay you a hundred bucks a month to take care of me. If I have to call you a hundred times a month, I know you'll be there. If I don't see you for a year, that's cool with me too, but I know you're there. It's like AAA. I don't call them every day, but when I get a flat tire, they dang well better be there because <laughs> I'm paying for that service. Right. So it's like that. Like we get patients calling us, apologizing for calling after hours, but they have an emergency going on. It's like, Hey, this is, this is what you're paying for. Like, this is what I'm getting paid to do. Right. It's not a problem. Like, but other times they'll call and the, the doctor on call is going to yell at them for calling after hours. Right. No one wants to deal with that. And that's what's happened is people are, have been judged by their doctors. They, the doctor puts him, I've done it too. I put people on insulin, then they gain 20 pounds. I go, dude, we just had to put you on insulin. You gain 20 pounds. Well, it's the insulin causing the weight gain. Right. And then we're blaming the patient and the patient's like embarrassed to come in and you, you get into this, like what Tro went through. It's so true what all these doctors are saying. And it's frustrating for people because people will go to their doctor and go, hey, you know, I'm, I'm listening to Dr. Tro. Can I get my insulin checked? And the doctor says, no, I'm not ordering that. That's There's no sense of that. It's useless. But they don't know. <laughs> it's one of the most important tests we could possibly get to know metabolic health, right? So it's those kind of things where, you know, no one says, hey, you got headaches. I mean, all the doctors sitting here will know. Someone comes in with headaches, stomach problems, migraines, tense neck, you know, all these things. You go, how's life? You don't have time to talk about that in eight minutes. But it's like, oh, I'm going through a divorce and my kids are sick and my, you know, I, I can't afford to, you know, I, I just got laid off. It's like, okay, let's talk about that. How do we, what would you, because that's the problem. It's not the headaches and the mind. That's just a symptom of the problem. So there's some, and, and like stress eating, stress, you know, all this stuff, alcohol use, like it's not because you just love the taste of alcohol. There's something else going on when you're drinking to obliteration every night. You know, so being able to sit there and say, why do we go into medicine? And that's why the burnout rate is so high, because you're not helping people. You're just you're just stringing them along and saying, OK, come back in three months. We'll recheck your A1C. Keep doing what you're doing. 
and you see them getting sicker and sicker and then they get amputations and they're on dialysis. We know that we know that how the story ends if we don't intervene and we and don't get paid look, to intervene. Can I just comment that you look animated and happy talking about this process? Well, it's both. No, it's like because, you know, Tro uses some salty language sometimes. And I get it because when you see someone come in and go, dang it, if we would have intervened a year and a half, two years ago, they never would have the diagnosis of diabetes the rest of their life. And when we see it coming, you say, oh, oh, we see what's coming and we can intervene and help. Like, it's not sexy to change your oil, but and, and do your little tune ups and change your brake pads before it's a total disaster. But in medicine, we celebrate changing your engine. Right. Because right? we're the best at changing your engine. But like, well, heck, I'd rather change my oil than my engine. Right. Right. So in primary care, we don't get rewarded for preventive care. We get rewarded for how many medicines you put that patient on. They have high cholesterol. You better have them on a stat. And they have high blood sugars. You better have them on this drug and this drug and this drug. So all of a sudden, we're reimbursed. Our quality of care is determined. You know, like we were talking about, it's you're, you're paid for efficiency, not effectiveness. Well, the more you guys, efficient we are, we, the more we get paid. You guys just did a great uh, podcast on your your podcast where you talked about motivations of physicians. I think it was in the context of diabetes care, and it's kind of it's it's like you say it's backwards. You're not doing the basic maintenance. You're just oh you need a you need to change an engine. Well, hey, we can do that. But well, in the most I mean, ideally thing. from from a patient's perspective. You want to avoid getting to that point, I think, or at least I do. <laughs> well, and Josh made that point that's critical, and I had to go through it for years. Was that you know someone comes in, they've had three stents put in, they got diabetes, they have all these other health problems, they have high blood pressure. The cardiologist goes, "You have to go on a vegan diet or a low fat diet." And it's like, well, when you give them low fat, doc, their sugars are going up and their A one C is getting higher and their insulin is going crazy, and so the patient, I go, just try it for a month. The patient loses thirty pounds. Their their everything normalizes. And the cardiologist sees it as, oh, they lost weight, so everything normalized. Well, no, they got metabolically healthy, and that's why everything normalized. They right? fix their diet and everything. They fix their diet, so it's a hard thing. So all they have to do is they see it over and over and over again. They're like, why is this guy's patients coming? I had 11 people come off insulin in six months. No one's ever – I've never seen that. I could, If you told me that, I would laugh and go, you're a nut. There's no way it's going to happen, right? People did it because we put – we gave them the education. A perfect example of the CGMs, a lot of doctor a continuous glucose monitors. One of my patients this week, he went for cauliflower crust pizza. His sugar went over 200. Non-diabetic patient. Next day, he went for sugar-free vanilla yogurt. His sugar went over 200. He would never know that unless he has a continuous glucose monitor or he's checking his finger sticks all the time. But you say it's sugar-free. It can't make my sugar go high. Clearly, it did. What? Why? I don't know. It did, though. <laughs> it just did. So now right. you know, okay, now next time he said, he came to me, I didn't tell him. He said, okay, I want to make different choices next time because now he knows. Otherwise, he'd have to say cauliflower crust pizza is obviously healthy, healthy for you. I have yet to see someone's sugars not go up with that. So, you know, you have to educate. I mean, there's so much, you know, it's marketing. People go, it's cauliflower crust pizza, but they're putting all these other flowers in it that aren't the standard flowers. And they say it's keto or they're, they're putting all the seed oils in. They go, it's keto because it's high fat. Well, that's not keto. That's not what we're talking about. Right. So that's the thing is that the education component is what's so critical. And that's, uh, you know, doctors are supposed to educate. Well, that's, 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 that was, you just ruined my clothes. That was going to be my clothes. So I'll say it now. The, the meaning of the word doctor is teacher. It's not physician, right? And that's why professors are doctor this or doctor that, doctor of philosophy. And you, I mean, it sounds like, the basic thing that Tro and you are doing, and I know Josh, you're bringing teacher back into the practice of doctor. Because Josh, Josh, talk to us about some your experience with some of the handouts that you've put together in your patient reactions. Sure. Uh, well, of course, now I feel pretty under, pretty uh, underwhelmed based on what they're doing. You guys are doing where I want to get, and that's that's one of my biggest frustrations is is how do I go from this lone provider making up these handouts to something amazing like that. I mean, I give the same spiel 20 times a day to 20 patients and it, it gets exhausting. It's almost like I wish I had everything pre-recorded and say, watch this. And then I'm going to come in and talk to you, you know? Um, but um, yeah. So, I mean, you guys are clearly at a, at a point of what, what 
would be amazing for my practice if I could figure out how to get to a similar thing. But, I mean, for now, I, I just have some uh, handouts. I, I have uh, um, a lot of my patients, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll usually try to start them with like a protein sparing modified fast. And so I have a handout with that, which is some kind of list of food. And then, um, and you're doing that by foods, not something like OptiFast or MetaFast. No, I just, I just foods. I, I don't really try to push like a lot of supplements or, or things like that for my patients. I just try to, I, I to talk to them about food and, uh, you know, my, my message to them is you can't treat, a diet induced disease with medications it's 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 not going to fix the problem but you have to fix the nutrition um and you're and, we're in a idaho's an agricultural state we're in an agricultural area explain the cow diet the cow diet the the you mean the well i mean like what i tell my patients is is you know if if you if you want to make a cow fat what do you feed it you feed it grain corn and soy and so i ask them if you think about that. What do you think happens to a human who eats grain, corn oil, and soybean oil? I mean, it's basically the same diet. And a lot of them will kind of be like, oh, that makes sense. Um, but, uh, and so I have these little phrases where I'm like, well, this is cow chow. Don't eat that. Try to eat more predator chow. Uh, just little things like that. But um, yeah, it, it, but it's tough. So I have a couple of handouts. I have a handout with the, the protein sparing modified fast. I'll usually try to get them to do that for four to 12 weeks and then to transition into a low carb, low omega-6 diet. Um, and I have a handout about uh, omega-6. Uh, and um, I, I, I struggle. I don't have I don't have nutritionist and health coach. I, it's tough. I see a patient and it's like, all right, I'll see you in three months, you know? And so maybe for two weeks, they're really motivated and they're doing it. And then they slip up, they fall through the weeds and then, you know, they come back in six months and it's like, ah, oh, what happened? You know? And so I think listening to you guys, what sounds really important is that consistent, you know, follow-ups. And like, I, I mean, you said in a six month period, I can't remember how many times you said the patient had interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, I mean, tell, tell that's what people, that's what people need. I mean, before Josh feels bad, don't, before you feel bad, we're cheating the system. Okay. Tro and I are cheating the system. And the reason we are is people are selecting us because they want to be healthier. Yeah. It's classic, and, classic, and, classic and selection am, bias. Uh, I am starting practice, to get some of that. I am in starting the standard to get practice, 80% why, but... of people don't want to get better. They go, just give me a pill. That's what right. I want. I want a pill. Give me a pill. I want to lose 30 pounds. Just inject me with that new stuff. It works for all my friends. And you say, well, there's side effects, there's other problems. Let's talk about it. Our job is to talk about risk and benefits and do informed consent and say, okay, here's the risk. Here's the benefit. Here's here's what you can expect. Here's what we're going to see in a year. When Tro has data at one year of weight loss, how many people maintain weight loss for a year? It's a minimal, minimal amount. You could do whatever you want. The biggest loser doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, recap shows, right? They, they don't have reunion shows. Because we know at a year, most of us are going to struggle and gain our weight back. So when you start seeing, even if someone maintains their weight for a year, that's a, that's a huge win looking at what the U.S. is doing. But the point I'm making is, you know, when 80% of your patients really don't care, it's really a struggle. And that's what I, I looked at. I go, like, I could spend an hour with you, but if you're not going to make a change, we're all wasting our time. Right. And the patient's sure. like, well, insurance is paying for it. My employer is paying for this. So that's why what Tro's doing. And and I've had the the honor of doing also is some some corporate health stuff where you go, people want to get healthier and, the, and it's not they're they're just checking a box. They want their their employees to be healthier. You want your sales force to be healthy and not sick all the time with diabetes complications. So wait a minute. Let's let's back up just a sec here. Talk about the corporate health. These are corporate health programs. I got was involved in one of these through uh my wife is a nurse at a hospital here in Boise, or she was a nurse until she left because her schooling's so crazy. Um, and we got into one of these corporate health programs, Virgin, you know, run by Virgin, and it would like sync up to my Strava app and it would tell me how many walk, how much walking I was supposed to do every day, and you know, gave me all this advice about food choices, all of which I ignored. <laughs> Because, you know, I'm kind of in a funny situation here when people say I eat, a, I eat a healthy diet and I say, well, that's exactly your problem. You're you're eating a healthy diet. I'm going to tell you how to eat an unhealthy diet that's going to scare a dietitian. You know, that's kind of a side topic here. But 
So that's the sort of thing that you're talking about doing that sort of corporate health program where you're going in and educating employees in a company. Yeah, Troy's doing that, and you know, and he has good data on it, you know. But you know, it, it's really saying, "Hey, look, you have a workforce; they want to be healthier." You know, I I took care of some ladies up in Vacaville, California. They're basically farm workers that don't even speak English, and we had a blast. We had so much fun, and they built a community. They started walking together after work, doing different things, and it wasn't the biggest loser. And that that's the thing is like all these work programs, they go, "Let's do six weeks, and you see who loses the most weight, weight, and they win a prize." And then at eight months, they've gained all their weight back plus some. Right. Right? That's what this company had done over and over. Now they understand metabolic health. They say, oh, you know, I had some of those women were eating, you know, 12 tortillas a day and they have full bone diabetes. They're shooting insulin. It's like, well, can we cut back on that? Can we make this change? And just with little changes over time, you see dramatic effects, you know? And so I know Tro, yeah, Tro is published on this stuff. So do you want to check a box and say, yeah, we tried some health stuff. We told everyone to, you know, do this, whatever program out there or do you say hey i really care about my employees the owner of this company uh she paid for continuous glucose monitors for all of her client all of her patients i mean all of her employees wow she paid for the education people didn't want to do it she said i'm not paying for it unless you're committed to doing this so 30 percent of the people in, in the business joined me and 30 percent crushed it the other ones gained weight and were terrible i mean they had the worst you look at just the food in their in their uh, break room and it's devastating you're like you have no chance you have no chance it's all processed garbage food they switched over some great companies you know pitched in and say hey we'll send up some samples they could try our stuff and so all of a sudden these people are getting healthier they're not sick as much and they're they're they built a, a camaraderie right they did it together and so we had so much fun and it, it doesn't have to be a torture session either so it's just kind of saying okay what can what works for you if you're not going to give up tortillas can we cut it from 22 a day down to seven can we do it start that way? And so little things like that. And that's why the the follow-up and 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 connecting. And when they see their coworker come off insulin, then all of a sudden they say, Oh, maybe I can do that too. Right. And that's the thing is when you say you have a pro chronic progressive disease, is you look up the definition of diabetes, it's a chronic progressive disease. And we say we don't agree with you. We think we can reverse that or at least put it into remission. And we right. can't. I know um, Kaiser Permanente, the big California healthcare plan, did a paper before Verta Health started trying to use a high fat diet to treat diabetes. And they looked across their huge patient population. And I think, you know, they had seen a couple of remissions, but it was like almost it was the, the statistical equivalent of their patients getting hit by lightning. It was so rare. And now you're talking about a significant portion of a small patient population being able to, you know, reverse diabetes or at least go off the meds for diabetes, which is huge on its own. I'll tell you the sad part. Approximately 70% of my patients are members of a big corporation like that. And they come to me. Right. Why? Because they're not getting the care they need. They're getting diet. And I see their charts when I get them. I say, oh, my gosh. They keep giving the same advice that's not working. I can see the progression. And you say, oh, I know what's coming. And then you see it coming, right? And you say, oh, my gosh. Like, had they have intervened in a reasonable manner in one of those big corporations, I reached out to them and said, hey, I'll come talk to your doctors for free and just show them that we can help people. No interest. No interest. No callback for free. There's not going to cost you anything. You could all say this guy's an idiot. But there's no interest in that. And I'll tell you that it is – one of my biggest education, just to give you an idea of the system problem is, you know, I worked a lot with HMO in my, in my, at my previous practice. And I got frustrated because I said, Gee, I don't get reimbursed for all the hours I spend away from my family to help patients. And I know I'm saving you money. I'm saving you money because these patients aren't getting bypass surgery. They're not getting dialysis. They're not having all these other complications that we know. And they said, you're costing us money. And I said, how can that possibly be? Well, you're checking insulin, you're checking stuff that other people don't check. And second of all, the sicker the patient gets, the more we get paid. That's the way it works. The federal government will give more money to the HMOs <clears throat> if their patients are sicker. What kind of healthcare is that? It's insane. Insanity. Because we all know if I put more diagnosis code, like Tro was saying, that the med students know how to add codes on and how to up bill, but they don't know how to get the patient healthier. Right? Yeah. And, and that's a sad, that's a sad statement when you go, we get more reimbursed, the sicker. My patient gets the more I get paid in our practice now, the healthier my patient is, 
the less they have to call me. I'm getting right. paid either way. <laughs> Hospital hospitals have utilization departments where they figure out how they have to code to get the maximum reimbursement out of a patient. And it generally involves, you know, adding stuff lying. on, right? Lying. It's not it's it not it's, it's never lying. doing less. It's almost always doing more, like figuring out. How to get somebody checked in as an inpatient that's like a huge payday for the hospital as opposed to doing less of an intervention and sending them home well that's you know you're not going to make it as much money and it's crazy it's a just total it's a totally counterproductive system from the perspective of the patient because you're not i mean and brian brian curly you can step in here because i mean i don't want they're Talk, talk a little bit about how you're practicing at a hospital. And I mean, you're in more of an acute care perspective where you, you know, if you go to, if I'm imagining that if somebody comes to you with a broken leg, just, you're not going to be talking about diet with them, maybe. Well, I'm, I'm getting my personal fulfillment out of my advocacy that I'm doing on the internet. So I'm just bad mouthing seed oils. And in doing so, justifiably so, <laughs> um, and in doing so, getting people to quit them and quitting seed oils is a gateway to more of an ancestral health approach. Some folks reflexively become low carb by doing that. Some folks go all the way to carnivore, but uh, it's a it's a continuum. And I'm regularly just being a influencer that way, regularly getting messaged about people losing weight and people getting healthier, which is the same kind of thing that I would get from, from a, from a patient. Now, you know, to be fair, full disclosure, I'm, you know, this is not medical advice on the internet. I'm just saying seedles are bad for you. Just like going out there and saying sugar is bad for you. You know, you, they, you, hopefully no one's going to be put in prison for that, but you know, like, um, uh, like our, well, who, who was our gentleman in, in, uh, was it South Africa or something? They got in Tim trouble Noakes. just for saying, yeah, Tim Noakes. Yeah. Hopefully that we don't turn into that in the, in the USA, just for giving, just for giving advice. But I, I do run in, and I'm, I've been a hospitalist now for like nine months. I just finished family medicine residency last year. But I do run into times when I absolutely have to bring up food. I have to do it. You know, and, you know, if I'm, I'm discharging somebody from the hospital, I have some time. They say, Doc, what do you think I should eat? And I just start laughing. I'm like, do, do, you, do you, you want me to go there? I'm like, okay. You know, and, and, I, and I go there on a lot of things. And sometimes you just have to. Like, you know, if you see someone who's, you know, in their thirties with a kidney stone or something, you're like, Oh gosh, like I, I just have to bring this up and I have to go into this. Um, and, um, and so I, I seed pill them, I food pill them, I red pill them, you know, I go through these things, but that's, that's just a case by case basis. That's not a system. I think what, what we have here is a classic. And you're in a, it, I mean, the, the, the practice of medicine that you're doing right now is properly transactional. You're seeing people at crisis moments yeah, typically, mm -hmm. and you're not, yeah trying to build a relationship like the other no. like the other three doctors are so yeah. there's yeah. and i mean i it's you know that's an it's not insignificant part of medicine it's a, one would argue the most important part of medicine when you're hurt getting good care well and i'm 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 finding a way what i did in residency because i did take care of of um, patients of all ages doing family medicine um it, you, know, you have to find, and this is what, you know, Dr. Durham, Josh, yeah, he, he has to do as well as find a way to make it work within the system. And um, so what we have here with, with these four doctors present is we've got the, the classic uh, private, you know, direct patient care versus the, the um, establishment and the, the difficult thing, the main, um, one of the main problems that we have in the difference is that we are tied to politics. What is in, the cafeteria at my hospital, what is in the, you know, when I order a cardiac diet for somebody, you know, how is that defined or a diabetic diet for someone? How is that defined? And, you know, uh, Dr. Lenskis and Dr. Tro, you know, they would, they would define that completely differently. I would privately define that pretty differently, but, but because of the fact that we have, you know, and we want to talk mechanism here, why is it the way it is? Because of the fact that there is, um, you know, government involved in, in, in different levels. And I'm not here to ar argue that point, but um, it is political. So what Washington DC, what they, what their view is of what a diabetic diet and what a cardiac diet is, is why my 
hospital will say X, Y, Z. It's why Josh's hospital system will say X, Y, Z. And until that changes, ours is going to change. So we have to find ways within our scope of practice and without upsetting our employers of how to, on a one-on-one -on -one basis with our patients, give them advice that, 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 that actually works, but, you know, advice that, that we, to be diplomatic, that we believe is more effective. Um, and, and that would, it, you know, to one extent you have folks jump and ship going, going direct primary care, but there are, there are plenty of people out there that, that will, will stay in the system because so, there's so many people in the system who want to save those folks with, with the good news of nutrition. And they're going to do things like utilize Dr. Tro's app or, and they're going to utilize, um, TikTok accounts and utilize YouTube videos and other accounts. So they can say, Hey, I'm Dr. So-and-so, but I love Dr. A, Dr. B, Dr. C, and I want you to check them out. And I agree with most of what they say. When it comes to your health, you come and talk to me about your hypothyroidism, about your peripheral vascular disease, about your neuropathy, you know, all those, all these, you know, these big ticket items come to me and talk to me personally. But when it comes to what to eat, they've got the system and they can do it, you know, and, um, uh, you know, they're, and I, I would love to see um, different layers of involvement that people people can have. You know, you know, obviously jumping ship and doing something direct primary care is is the big one, right? If you're if you're a primary care, but you know, how can we, you know, how can folks like Dr. Tro reach out and have people get involved? You know, I'm, and I'm just we didn't talk about this beforehand. This is just me spitballing. You know, get involved in other levels. You know, like associate providers or you know you know um, uh, uh, you know people that are just ideologically on the same page of these things. That's you know, how can you get resources? Um, Tucker, you and I were working on the CD app, which is just going to be, what is seed oil free out there? You right. Know, right? I'm, at, I'm at my grocery store. I'm at Whole Foods. What do I buy that's seed oil free? That's just very basic. Those those types of tools are, is, is what is what going to help people. Um, those tools are, are what are going to make the big difference, right? Well, it's, because, it's, um, it's what Tro was talking about, moment zero. I mean, yep. a big moment zero yep. for everybody is when they're in the supermarket. Exactly. And yeah, yeah. what they walk out of there with is going yes. to determine yeah. whether or not they wind up, you know. Yeah, because because Kellogg's is not going we to all, do it all the way, and yeah, and we all and we the all know that what system is not going to go all the way right now. It's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And if you have crap food in your house, you're going to eat it. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. basic. And law well, so one, of the universe. one more thing is that you know, from from being someone who's been following the ancestral health movement for. Um, you know, 15 years or so longer than that. Um, you know, there is like, like, like Brian was saying, um, you know, there's about, and I, this is one of the things I've, I've, I've picked up on from, from many folks and found it to be true in practice. There's about 15% of the general population that's actually going to try the crazy diet. Um, and, uh, but what, what I find exciting about seed oil disrespect and what I'm doing with, with, with the advocacy for that is that seed oils don't even taste good. <laughs> So everyone would rather just eat butter and olive oil. Um, uh, but, but still, you know, there's, there's more to it than, than just that. I, I look at that as the gateway drug to, to better health. Um, and, um, you know, just, just having these kind of tools, having these kind of networks, folks on the, the direct primary care side, you know, you're building these great businesses, you're helping, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, the more resources you all develop, that can also be adopted by folks on the inside, the better. And um, and it becomes harder to ignore. Oh, sorry, I'm I'm getting excited here because of what you all are talking about. I I haven't even thought about the potential of the corporate working with corporations because on a on a high level, you've got corporations talking about meatless Mondays and you know some of this you know fake meat a lot, a lot of this you know vegan propaganda type BS. But you can't hide the numbers. And when the corporations of different sizes are having or people are having success losing weight. They're they're and because they're gonna look at the bottom line, they're they're spending less on 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 healthcare costs because they're because their employees are getting healthier. You will not be able to hide that fact. So what you all were, what you were talking about with working with corporations, that's huge. And th you're, they're not gonna be able to hide it. They're gonna see the benefits, and that's something that's gonna spread like wildfire. And that's as something long, that as long as that information can be shared. Yeah, that's something that Tro is doing that's super important that you know. I remember having conversations with him about this on Twitter years ago is, and it's something that I've talked to Josh about, right? Having the data 
to turn around and show that your practices are actually improving people's situation is so unbelievably powerful. And, you know, the problem with, I mean, a huge problem with healthcare is they're using these data systems in the wrong way, right? They've got an amazing amount of visibility into what they're doing and they're not using it to improve outcomes. There's an old saying in engineering, if you want to change something, first you have to measure it, right? And what they're doing is they're measuring it, but they're not measuring health as an outcome, as a product of their process, right? And that's just a huge, a huge problem. They're piling all this stuff on doctors. They're making doctors hate it. I mean, I, I read recently that a lot of physicians spend more time during the day interacting with their electronic record system than they do with their patients, which is nuts. Um, you know, having run a system like that on Wall Street of work tracking and they're key, you learn a lot from them. They're super helpful. But when your people are spending more time on that than they are actually doing their jobs, that's, you've totally gone down the wrong path. But anyway, we've been at this for over an hour now. We should probably start to wind up. Um, I'll go in reverse order. Brian, what did, what sort of summary do you, what's your summary of this discussion? So I've, I've been in, in many um, different positions in terms of my perspective of this. You know, I, I, I know what it's like to be a, a parent and an adult before I even was a doctor. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, my, my takeaway from this discussion is uh, keep doing what you're doing, Dr. Tro, Dr. Lenskis. Um, uh, you will make these topics harder to ignore, um, continue to develop excellent tools that folks like myself and, uh, Josh, Dr. Durham can, can use for our patients. Um, cause I don't, you know, the answer is not just for everyone to jump ship, but, you know, for, for you all to keep doing what you're doing, um, you know, more tools for, for us. And, um, you know, the more we do and the more people we help, the harder it becomes to ignore. And eventually we can see things change on the inside. Um, and, you know, th this just continues to grow and, um, and I'm, it's just exciting. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> That's awesome. Josh. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. This was kind of a little emotional roller coaster for me because, you know, seeing patients get healthier and deprescribing is like the best part of my day. I would love to see it happen more often, but I feel I need resources like what you guys are talking about. Um, so that to me, to be able to come up with something like what you guys are doing is is overwhelming for me. So I'm interested in trying to learn more about what you guys are doing and and how can I utilize your resources potentially. Um because in those few patients that listen to me and it changes their life, like, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I had a lady send me a card the other day and she was down 15 pounds in three weeks. And she said, you're the first doctor that's ever talked to me about food. You've given me a second chance. I'm going to rebuild my body. And I mean, I literally almost want to cry because it's exciting. Um, but I just don't have the kind of resources you guys have. And, um, it's uh it's tough it's tough but um it's it's exciting to hear that these things are out there um and so i look forward to looking at more into your guys's uh programs and seeing how i might be able to utilize some of those kinds of things for my patients so that that's awesome yeah thanks josh brian lens there you go Sorry, unmute took a second. Yeah, I mean, it's so encouraging to see you guys stepping up and looking. I mean, the fact that you're even talking nutrition with your patients, that you care, I mean, that's that's the most critical part. So many people, docs, I'm telling you, I watched burnout. They don't care anymore. They're just going through the motions. They're getting their paycheck. And, you know, one of the the terrible things about medicine is, is and, and, and I was hostage to this also, is like, you look at the finances, you go, man, I'm going to take a huge hit. Like, but when I saw Tro one time going on vacation after we went to a medical conference, I'm like, how in the heck are you doing that? I'm going to go and work 80 hour weeks, you know, just to try to catch up for the next two months. We're taking two days off. 
So, you know, when you start looking at it from that perspective, we have to take care of ourselves and put our oxygen mask on, you know, if we're miserable and, and going through them, my wife would tell me I would do, I do, I've always volunteered doing medical missions all over the world. And she goes, when you come back from those, you work, your, you work more hours there and you're like on fire, just talking stories and you're so excited. How come every night when you come home and I ask you how you're doing, you're, you're like miserable, right? It's the system that beats you down. And so, I, and I think that's a big part of it. We all came into medicine, not to support pharma, but to help, uh, help people. So once we start doing that again, the, the best part of it is, is, uh, you know, seeing those labs and the, the A1C and the stopping the meds. And it's so exciting. It's so much fun. I love it. And my patients, as an example, we had a zoom meeting, this young guy who could barely say three words when I first met him, because he used to be over 500 pounds. Now he's leading the group inspiring other people helping other people and so it gives hope when you see it can be done you know no one wants to hear it can't be done and you're killing yourself no one wants to hear that or be criticized because you ate a cookie one time you know it's all this stuff that we've been handling it the wrong way and i think as we learn and we help each other then we're getting fed that way and our those five things that we talked about at the beginning we could start living that way because a stressed out, you know, doctor who's drinking every night to cope with life and having a mar marriage problems and all that and no relationships with friends. They're not a good doctor. You can't possibly help people when you're 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 drowning yourself. So I think that's a huge take home. I'm glad you're looking at it and saying, OK, how do we do it? Can we do it within the system? It can be done, but I think it's a thousand times harder. I just do. I think it's just the way the system is because, you know. You know, having group meetings, your corporation is going to say, no, you can't do that. There's HIPAA violation. This could happen. That could happen. So it's a hard thing when you say, uh, you know, how do we do it in, a, in an efficient way? But, you know, there's people who do it. You know, Jason Funk's still in the system doing it, you know, and helping people. So there's a lot of people who can do it, but it's just um, it's just the toll it's going to take on us because we invest a lot. And when you invest in it, it cuts into your personal life and all this that you start to resent it after a while. So that would be my advice. I'd say, hey, how do I do it? And sometimes it's a scare. The scariest thing ever was jumping ship. But once I did, I never looked back. You know, I never looked back and I go, look, I'm paying my bills. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not struggling, but I'm not making as much money. But what would I do with that extra money? <laughs> Counseling? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when you're working like that, when you can't take a day off because your dad's sick, whatever it is, because we we're so busy. You know, if you're seeing 30 patients and you take a day off, those are those 30 patients have to get in your schedule somewhere. So, you know, all those kind of things, I think is just thinking about it, it's like, how do I limit, you know, and, and be able to have some balance in life? I think that's that's what young physicians are going to struggle with a lot. Right. Thanks, Brian. Tro. Yeah, I want to come back. Uh, I, I a couple things I just made a mental note about. I, I thought also uh, it was patient selection. Like I thought the people choosing to come see me are the ones that are losing weight and I, that this isn't uh, applicable to a larger population. And what I figured out was that's not true. Um, you know, I was thrown a 7,000 company, a 7,000 employee company. I knew none of them. None of them knew me. Right. And they threw their sickest at me and we published those results. Right. Which was 52 pounds at a year right? 52 pounds of weight loss. So they didn't choose. They didn't choose me. They didn't know who I was. I wasn't some superstar that they knew about. I didn't see my social media account or their podcast. So I think to come back, well, what does that mean? That means good, solid nutrition, focus on behavior, focus on patient empowerment, and focus on easy access to care is, is the magic, right? That's the magic. And just, right? just, so, you keep saying behavior. Just one point there. I've heard you say on another podcast that I guess it was one of the students who's working with you that they were surprised that you're spending 10% of your time talking about diet and 90% of your time talking about behavior and, you know, how did the actual practice of making all of this work with patients? Is that, is yeah, that correct? A uh, hundred, uh, that's actually 110% correct. So, so you know, you want them, let's just say you want them to have less uh, seed oils and less processed carbohydrates, right? So, you know, the, the, the Trinity that, that uh, Dr. Brian had mentioned, um, you know, you want them to do that, but they crave pizza. So it's not an education issue, right? You told them avoid these things, right? But here's a problem. They crave pizza. So how do you go? Well, pre pizza does actually doesn't have a lot of uh, sugar in it and, and not too much processed oils, but 
how do you get them from pizza to your definition of healthy? Right. And, and they probably adopt that definition of healthy. Most people coming to me, when you ask them, we ask them flat out, what is a healthy diet to you? They say protein and vegetable. 99% of people say protein and vegetable. So they don't need help defining what health is. They don't. They have a good definition of health. Most of most people. Right. There's some people in inner cities, stuff like that. We've had to, you know, uh, help educate them. So they have a concept of health. So your job is to get them to their concept of health. Right. And so that's behavior. Right. That's that's all behavior. Now, if they don't understand, they don't know oh, there's a knowledge gap. Right. Then you come in and you give them nutritional information. Right. But most of the time it's behavior. It's it, and nutrition is just like a, a guide, a beacon. You know, it's not it's not much more than that. So. Um, but, yeah, uh, to come back, I don't think it's selection. And then. You know, if I was back in my office, I'm just thinking, Josh, I'm just thinking about you here. If I was back in my office and uh, in a big hospital practice, I would put out a poster saying, you know, ask me if you want help losing weight. Right. Because people don't care about, you know, they care about metabolic health, but they don't really know that they care about it. They care about weight. Right. They care about their cravings, what foods you're going to take away from them. These are the things they care about. So it would be something like a big poster board in your office. Ask me, you know, to, to how to lose weight and I will help you address your cravings. Something like that. That's it. And then you never need to bring it up again. You got a big poster. It's right there, stares at them. And then they come and say, hey, what, what's that poster? Right. And if you want, we'll give you uh We'll give all your patients free access to our app. How about that? How wow. about that? I'm yeah. gonna. I, I'll give you. I'll give you, like pamphlets. You can just send them out. They can get free access to it. Okay, and you can just send them to our app. Okay, so now you do the nutritional meshes, and that'll be echoed. Right? They'll have a community to to echo that, and where you you're you're sort of safe in that. We could even build you out like a section, like your corner, you know, which would like all your patients can be there. So, so there's that, but all I would do if I was in your position, just put a poster, design a poster, take one of Ted Naiman's. I, seven years ago, I asked <laughs> Ted Naiman, I was like, Ted, can I jack your shit? And he was like, yeah, totally. Go ahead. You know, Ted, and I have, Ted Naiman's another physician who's probably missed his career as a graphic designer. He does beautiful, beautiful yeah. work in simply conveying nutritional ideas for people. Yeah, I mean, I, exactly. So I just, and I, that he's my, uh, he's on all the screens in my office. All of his, you know, a lot of his images and some some from Diet Doctor are up there uh, with permission. So they're on the screen save. There's a slideshow of their stuff. So just if you, if then this way, you are now assessing readiness to change. What you're doing is like, come ask me if you're ready to change is basically what you're doing. And so now you're getting people who are ready to change. You know where to put your effort into and for everybody else, you have a postcard at the front desk on, hey, there's this app. If you're interested, you can join it, right? And you don't need to do much else. Now you're living right. Like you don't need to tell the person with obesity, hey, I have a plan for you. It's like they will come to you. You know, they'll come to you because they see it. So my advice to you is if I was in the system and I wanted to stay in the system, I was happy in the system, right? I would say, just put a big old poster. Ask me about nutrition. I'll help you lose weight. We'll address your cravings. Yeah. Okay. Nice. We'll, right. And yeah. and and That's then good. you put up you put a little poster. We'll send you like a, a a little postcard, right? That you could put in the front desk, and it's it'll give them free access to the app, and they can scan a QR code, and if they want it, they go they go there. You could send people there. So, but to to come back, it's not it's not patient selection, Brian, because I I thought that was the case. It's, it's, uh, it's not, it's, it's patient empowerment. It's that that's it. And they need tools like a seed oil app, or like a, you know, in our app, it's like, okay, what do you, foods do you crave? Cause why don't people stick to diets? Well, I was hungry. I was craving foods. I felt deprived. Those are like one, two and three top reasons. So you have to be able to address their cravings. So we literally go food by food. You know, one of the top foods that people crave chocolate, pizza, bread, you know, ice cream, uh, uh, you know, chips. 
right? Okay, Carnivore yeah. Crisps, uh, Quest Pizza, which has uh, high oleic, uh, uh, high oleic acid, uh, um, high oleic uh, sunflower oil, if I'm not mistaken. So, right, you know, a much better if, option. Yeah, I don't know if that's approved, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. It is. Um, and then, and you know, chocolate. You you know, if you can get over the cadmium, you know, there's lilies and you know, um, you know, et cetera, the ice cream, these are, so you, if you can address five foods, which 90% of people struggle with, then they don't really have much of a problem, right? Sticking to a marginally improved diet. And then what's their, their own vision of health is protein and vegetable. They only need those when they're struggling, right? They have a vision of health. It's protein and vegetable, right? right? So you don't need to do much. So anyway, I'm talking a long time here. Bottom line is, you're, uh, you know, to come back to Dr. Brian's point, the truth is, and, and, and actually, Tucker, your point was this, it is the data that will make this easy. So it is, we are collecting systematically data, we're coming on two year data on our on our cohorts, our employee wellness cohorts. So we have about 200 patients in this one company, and we're just starting with an, a second one. And that data is it. Right, and we know what the results will be because Verta did it, and Dr. Unwin's done it. We know what it'll be, right? And it's that level of data that's going to make that enough of a groundswell where we can spread this message more readily. In my opinion, that's that's great. Thank you, Joe. I I just want to make a point to kind of back up what you're saying is. You were 350 pounds at one point. You never set out to become 350 pounds, I'm sure. And you weren't happy being 350 pounds. You've talked a lot, even here about the struggles that brings along. I think one thing that we that we all have to recognize, there's there can be a blame the patient mindset. Every one of these people wants to be healthier right? It's a very rare person who actually sets out to be unhealthy. I mean, the movie Leaving Las Vegas is not a typical story, right? Most of these people are just looking for some good guidance. And, you know, having set a, having physicians like you gentlemen who bring the teacher back to the practice of being a doctor is just going to be phenomenal for all of these patients who, like Tro once was, are just looking for the right answer so they can fix it and get back to being healthy. And it's really, I mean, it's thank you gentlemen for doing this. It's really, it's uh, it's really inspiring. It really is. It's just great seeing how this can be done and how you can help people at scale, getting out of the, getting out of the office and, you know, taking a whole company on as a patient. That's really, that's really exciting. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm.